Welcome, folky friends. My name is Vanessa Y. Rogers, and you are listening to Fabric of Folklore, the podcast where we unravel the mysteries of folklore. And my hope with this podcast, as we dig deep into the meaning of folklore, behind folklore, is to help us to understand one another better. Because although we are all unique individuals and we come from uh, unique families with different cultures and traditions, we are all connected in this life journey. And understanding folklore makes that really clear. So I hope you're all ready uh, because we have a fantastic show today. Um, Not only is our guest stellar, but we are going to be talking about the psychology of folklore, which is just going to be mind-blowing. Um, so welcome, Dr. Bronner. Um, let me give you a, a little intro first. Uh, Dr. Bronner is a distinguished professor of American studies and is folklore emeritus at Pennsylvania State University. He received his PhD in folklore um, and American studies from Indiana University and is the author of many, many books on and relating to folklore. The two will mostly be referencing today, however, is The Meaning of Folklore and Whirligig's The Art of Peter Gallagher, which was co-authored by Lynn Gamwell. And this section of this collaborative book covers the convergence between the two fields of psychology and folklore. So welcome so much, Dr. Bronner. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Um, so let's get started with talking a little bit about you and your journey into uh, folklore. How did you find out about the the field and um, what brought you to it? Well, I could tell you that officially it was because I took a transformative course my first year of college that was on folklore by someone by the name of Bill Nicolaisen, who was a truly an inspiring teacher. And I hope everyone's listening has one of those in their in their mm-hmm. lifetime. And although I had come to Binghamton University to study history and political science, uh, that uh, truly changed my uh, direction at, at that point. I would tell you, though, unofficially, I feel like I lived folklore and I knew about it even before then because I was an immigrant and from uh, parents who were uprooted from Europe and the war. And in that experience uh, coming to the United States and and also before then to the Middle East, uh, I became very aware of other cultures Mm. all around me and trying to figure out where I fit in. And folklore is a key to identity. And so not only in my school experience and in my ethnic school experience, but also in just that journey and that migration that I think a lot of your listeners who either know immigrants or have been an immigrant uh, probably uh, share. Was there an experience that you that you recall where you felt different in particular? Uh, there are many that I would <laughs> say. And I think uh, one of them is uh, just the home experience. I I did play sports, which my parents did not understand at all, and especially the American game of football, which <laughs> I was uh, attracted to and made no sense to them, mm-hmm. as certainly. And and uh, even watching it, they still couldn't figure out what was going on. And later on, I got to write about that as the American game and why Europeans do not understand the American (laughs) game of football. And again, I I found psychological reasons for that that have to do with the American experience of the frontier, or or that's what I hypothesized. And and that uh, piece has gained a lot of traction. Well, cool. We'll we'll definitely have to add a link for that because that sounds like a very interesting piece. So what um, about the field do you enjoy today? I think because I'm exposed to it every day and particularly as I found myself 
betwixt and between the old world and the new world, I've often found that, that folklore was that bridge and that that sense of expression that we mm. all have but may, may not be aware of. Often in my pieces, I talk about everyday life and things that are common. And then when I identify them as folklore and analyze them as such, I think it's an eye opener for people. They're familiar with children's rhymes. They're familiar with proverbs. Mm -hmm. They don't always have cognizance of what their meanings are to their Mm -hmm. lives. And that's where I think being a folklorist is indeed significant and especially a chance to talk about tradition. Mm-hmm. We have historians talking about the past. We have sociologists talking about society. I feel that we don't talk about tradition enough and its relationship to modernity, even though I think that's crucial to our human existence. Modernity? I'm not familiar with that word. Uh, modern uh, oh, Modernization, okay. progress, technology, these mm-hmm. kinds of things that we often assume displace what, what has come before mm-hmm. or or what is uh, cultural and we talk about that process as being ongoing but especially in the 20 20th century and in the 21st century there's a sense that that pace of modernization and modernity is accelerating maybe because mm-hmm. of technology particularly and every day you can hear people talk about what was lost and and concern about their cultural identity and that yeah. feeling of belonging. And that mm-hmm. comes from folklore, I would argue. Yeah. Well, so I um, discovered you because I found the one of the books that you wrote called The Meaning of Folklore. And I was really excited about um, talking to you about this book because when I started this podcast, that was the whole reason I, w- I wanted to do this podcast was because I wanted to understand what you know, what was behind folklore, what was behind the folk tales that I was reading my my children, I wanted to understand their meaning and their significance. And so it, it seemed to like, it seemed serendipitous that uh, I would find a book that kind of encapsulated um, exactly that title. And then when you told me, uh, when I was emailing you and you said it was about the, the late Alan Dundas, yeah. <laughs> I was kind of um, astounded because I had I had seen his quotes everywhere, and I I didn't actually know who he was. I had just seen his him quoted all over the place. So, anyways, I I feel like this is a a, a great place to start. Um, so, can you tell us about uh, the book, the meaning of folklore? What is it about, and um, why why you felt the need to write it? Well, that's actually a good segue from what I said before, because Alan Dundee's is credited for what is often called the modern definition of folklore. And Mm -hmm. probably still some of your listeners are thinking folklore is something that isolated hillbillies have uh, somehow in some remote holler playing on a banjo and not really having (laughs) great human communication. whereas. Uh, And there's still some of that in uh, the studies of peasants in in Europe. But what Dundee suggested is that, in fact, the expression of folklore is an everyday need, a human need, and it has not been displaced by technology and computers and media. But, in fact, those devices actually enhance the communication of folklore, and he came up with this idea that a folk group is going to consist of two or more people who have any trade in common and use tradition to give them a sense of identity. So that means Mm -hmm. radio engineers, doctors, lawyers, highfalutin elites uh, have folklore if they associate Mm -hmm. with a group and they have inside jokes, if they Mm -hmm. have sayings, if they have nicknames. In fact, you could argue that the first bit of folklore that we all have is the naming of a child, Mm -hmm. right? And 
and how we tell a story about why that person got uh, that that particular name. So that was very influential on me, uh, particularly in school, as I was a child of the 60s, and there are all kinds of cultural revolutionary things going on at the time and questions about modernization, culture, and counterculture at the at the time. And then Dundee's went on, and this is probably more of the controversial part of his studies, to suggest that we project anxieties, aspirations, and joys through folklore, that the reason it is necessary and an everyday experience is because we have everyday anxieties that are disturbing to us. And so one of the ways to deal with them is to externalize them, whether that's transference or to symbolize them. We often disguise our feelings or we talk about our prejudices through jokes or we tell stories about our daily experiences to uh, others and started analyzing those things often with results that were not cheery, that were not sugary sweet, the way we we mm. think sometimes of uh, folklore is cute, right? Folklore is quaint. And he was mm. talking about racist jokes. Mm -hmm. He was he was talking about uh, sexual sayings. He was talking about insults and he was talking about songs, body songs sometimes, and why those persist. And then I think I followed that up, and in the meaning of folklore, suggest some ways in which that does occur with other kinds of, of forms. I'm particularly interested in children's folklore because of the idea that folklore is very influential on our human development, for example. Mm -hmm and that the games and the sports and the stories we tell, the gestures that we have and learn at that time often from peers are going to uh, affect our, our future and understanding that mm -hmm. process and also why new forms of folklore emerge. So it's not just studying, let's say, a gesture and then tracing it back all the way to ancient history but even those that may have emerged recently, what their origins are and why we did them. An example uh, that is actually in another book, The Practice of Folklore, is uh, Who's Your Daddy? that I found really emerged at the end of the 1990s. It tended to be male-centered. I would study the situations in which it arose. It seemed to be a new genre so to speak. And I asked, why did it emerge? No one knows the origin of it, but yet it's something that millions of people recognized, even if they didn't practice it themselves. And yes, right. it is related to an anxiety that uh, people have, particularly uh, about uh, gender relations. So, uh, so explain that a little bit more. How can you explain what anxiety they would be exhibiting by saying, who's your daddy? Sure. Uh, during the time it arose, there w was the feminist movement, women's movement, which was really challenging the equality of the sexes. And what, and, year, what year range are we talking? Uh, Mid-90s. Okay. Yeah. Mid. And... I was even able to trace its rise and its fall somewhat uh, after the turn of the millennium there. And it especially seemed to come out in sports, which were still mm -hmm. segregated uh, by sexes at that time. Now we're having controversies about wrestling and uh, those mm -hmm. that are integrating different uh, sexes and uh, particularly in basketball, where there was a lot of dominance, this idea of the tall player being dominant over the short player. And one of the analyses was that what that did is to put the other player in a feminine position. So mm -hmm. by saying, 
who's your daddy you're infantilizing or you're making mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. other player into a woman symbolically mm-hmm. right and this was at least in that frame uh, a way to express some of the anxieties about change about social change that was going on at the time one may argue that it lost popularity later because it wasn't as much of an issue although others are looking at other examples in which uh, particularly workplace kinds of tensions are mediated by jokes and sayings and so forth. Mm-hmm. How interesting. Um, so you said that Alan Dundies, is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Dundies? He, he uh, did a lot of feather ruffling. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. He was a strong advocate for particularly psychological approaches. He taught at UC Berkeley, a Mm -hmm. very prominent institution, and produced a lot of students who followed in this idea of modern folklore, but uh, probably fewer who uh, went along the path of psychological kinds of analyses, because it puts us as observers in a difficult position. We're telling you what you think, and Mm -hmm. that can have uh, certain consequences for your social relations, let's let's face it. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, there might be times and you'll say, actually, as a bit of folklore, I don't know what came over me. Mm-hmm. And then I'll say, well, I have a theory <laughs> to try out on you, see what you think. But for a lot of folklorists who are studying people who are uh, not necessarily in the limelight, Uh, This can be a fragile kind of relationship. And then, yeah, if I say, as as I have, and I've worked uh, with people in this regard, that the carving of wooden chains in old age is an idea of the youth orientation and and dealing with the anxiety of death, Mm. Uh, that's going to be difficult for them to admit, but I'm saying that's the reason they're doing it in mm-hmm. many ways. Mm-hmm. From your observations. Yes. Mm-hmm. So what did folklore look like before he started making um, these claims of modernity? Modernity. <laughs> uh, well, I could tell you even in my early classes, the examples that were given was someone going into the Southern Appalachians, such as Cecil Sharp, mm-hmm. who got renowned. He was an, an English folk song and folk dance enthusiast. And he got very excited because he heard that in the isolated mountains of the Southern Appalachians, there were people who were singing what he thought were ancient British ballads. And what were they doing there? So he went and he started hearing these ancient songs. And this was a kind of model everywhere. And other people started going into the backwoods and they just assumed that it was, it consisted of people who the folk and even the use of the noun who were isolated and did not have contact with modernity, again, to use that that term. So people also looked for folk tales that were Mm -hmm. on the scope of Cinderella and, and the Grimm's tales from the 19th century that people spoke now. And in, again, the Southern Appalachian, great excited excitement about jack tales because they related to jack and the beanstalk that people mm. imagine were all gone and and ancient and there's value in that there's an aesthetic to that that we find this great artistry and sometimes the assumption that people are illiterate but yet they can recite 50 verses of mm-hmm. an ancient ballad like lord randall uh, for example or black jack davy uh, songs that some of your listeners may may know, but yet Dundee's is suggesting you could hear it in the workplace. And in fact, Mm -hmm. one of his books was on something called photocopied broadsides. There were these illustrations that were copied on, 
on a copier or fax at that time. Don't know what the origins were, but they repeated, they varied, and people would hang them on the wall. They were a photocopied form of humor. Now we, we find them on the internet, and there's also the idea that there's internet folklore. There's folklore generated. We talk about memes or some mm-hmm. of the digital folklores talk about that. And so you have a very different kind of landscape with taking your horse and equipment, that huge equipment in the back of a car, as Alan Lomax in the famous Library of Congress expeditions to the South did, to receiving emails with humor or proverbs and trying to collect them, analyze them, and fact to interview the the senders about Mm -hmm. why did they send that and why do they use that as an avatar or whatever it is. And why were you inspired to write this book? The Meaning of Folklore? Mm -hmm. Well, I learned a great deal from Dundee's. I was aware that he felt that folklorists didn't pick up on his psychological theories as much as they should. Mm -hmm. He died prematurely. At what age did he die? He died at the age of 70. And And he was still active in the field. Oh, yeah. I mean, again, he generated his own legend and because he died in the classroom. He had a heart attack while he was teaching. I actually know one of the students who was there at the time. It was uh, very scary. But again, it's this idea he's so dedicated to the field. that he died while teaching and he was supposed to retire shortly after that. But he, yeah, he wasn't going to retire. He went out with his boots on to use a bit Mm -hmm. of of, uh, folklore. And the story is that at the time I was reviewing a book of his, our manuscript that was about to be published. And so then I, went back to the publisher and I said, well, what are you going to do now that he's got some valuable material, but he's, he can't work on it. And you got to be careful the conversations that you start because then they said, well, why don't you write it? (laughs) And the irony, irony is that he had asked me to write a forward to the book, but then Mm -hmm. it turned into my uh, doing his biography, talking about his analysis, uh, doing these headnotes on on some of his materials and adding uh, other kinds of material to it. So it truly was a labor of love, but then Mm -hmm. an opportunity to turn what he had written in the last 40 years to look ahead to the future and what this kind of work can result in that I think can benefit us all by giving us insight on why we do what we do and how we think and act. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of one of the things he studied that um, looked at why we do what we do? Sure. Maybe continuing on the feminist theme. When I, in my folklore classes, asked for examples of children's folklore, often what would be proposed was a kind of ritual that people had different names for, sometimes called Bloody Mary, sometimes mm-hmm. Mary Worth. And it was always girls. They And because I was teaching college undergraduates, they would say, well, we did this when I was 12, 13. Uh, I was often in elementary school or middle school, and we often had a slumber party. We might go into a bathroom, light a candle, and say, uh, Mary, I believe in you three times. And then they would think that the candle would go out, or they would see something, and they would all scream. And that would be the uh, end of the ritual. Mm -hmm. So people had noted this before, this ritual and this rhyme, it has a lot going on and it raises questions. Why 
only girls. Why don't boys engage in this? Why at that age? And then more to the point, why do people express this or what is the ritual for? Mm -hmm. And Dundee's proposed that what was missing from the analyses, because people were just thinking it's a pre-adolescent kind of prank or whatever, is the importance of Bloody Mary. So that was often there, and sometimes they would even uh, prick their finger to produce blood, and there was often a story associated with the girl in the mirror as someone who died prematurely. Mm -hmm. And he proposed this was because of a fear of menstruation by mm -hmm. pre-adolescent girls. Mm -hmm. This was an anxiety that in American society was very difficult to broach. Other societies work on that transition and they would have rituals to mark it, make it public. In American society, we tend not to. And so this was sublimated, if you will, and came out mm -hmm. in this ritual that explains why it's about girls and the symbolic projection of Bloody Mary as someone a little older had gone through this, but there's a certain horror in mm -hmm. her in her blood. And there are people who disagreed with him because it's not easily proved. Mm -hmm. He didn't have interviewees who said, yeah, we did it because I was having anxieties over menstruation coming mm -hmm. in my first period. Uh, mm -hmm. But he would show that through the ritual and the idea that the narratives that were expressed often had this association with a young girl, often with blood. He uh, made the case uh, for people to think about, uh, not just to make some kind of grand psychological theory, but also to suggest or to point out, yeah, there's this anxiety and we should be aware of it. So he had an applied aspect too, in that he often mm -hmm. would hold up what he would think would be disturbing images, such as Again, his work on racist jokes and ethnic jokes as well, and say by understanding the motivations, by understanding their meanings, we might have insights and then some solutions as to uh, how to deal with the source problems. And so folklorists don't conduct studies. Is that, would that be a correct assessment? Well, if you mean mm -hmm. laboratory. Yeah. Kinds of studies. Not so much. There are some laboratory studies that have been published, but folklorists generally work in the field. They work with mm -hmm. real life situations. There is a famous laboratory kind of study of someone who tr introduced a Shakespeare story with Bush people in Africa because he wanted to see if it became folklore and examined the transmission process. And indeed he found out, but then it got adapted to their cultural values. And, and so that's a, a famous one that is often cited in terms of the, the folkloric process. So the story changed considerably. Right. For right. They, they weren't saying, Oh, here's a story by Shakespeare, that now we're going to tell you orally that he got incorporated into their structure, but mm -hmm. he knew it because he introduced it. So how do you feel like um, his ideas has influenced your work in particular? Well, I use the idea of projection and also symbolism a great deal. I think uh, perhaps a difference uh, between us is that I'm also looking at more practices. He, because of his, some of his literary interests, would often be looking for texts, if you mm -hmm. will. And I was interested in the things that people do that mm -hmm. they may not identify as a joke, a tale, a story, mm -hmm. but then I would see them repeated and 
embroider them with uh, cultural aspects and re- and report that out. And one of the pieces that I did in the practice of folklore that has gotten attention, for example, is that I uh, pointed out that when there were school shootings, there tended to be an accusation that the shooter must have had Asperger's syndrome. Is that folklore? But the way that I viewed it, it was a repeated story that was associated with that event to try to explain what is unexplainable or unfathomable. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, again, people seem to resonate with that because there was often a need after, and unfortunately those events have continued. And Mm -hmm. with each one, I still see the same thing of trying to explain how could that happen? And Mm -hmm. folklore was one of the ways to uh, revert to that, to find the explanation for an unfathomable event. Mm -hmm. Well, let's shift focus a little bit um, and talk a little bit more about the psychology, the convergence of psychology and folklore. And so you uh, co-authored a book with um, Lynn Gamwell, and yes. um, you wrote a, a section towards the end. Can you tell us a little bit about what that um, was about? Sure. Well, first, I have to give you a background that I had mm-hmm. earlier done a book on woodcarvers okay. called Old Men Crafting Meaning, in which I was asking why men in old age would carve what seemed to be meaningless chains made out of wood. And where is this that you're seeing people carving? It, this was things? actually my dissertation, which was in southern Indiana. Okay. And I identified over a dozen of these wood carvers and found out what their story was, often relocated from rural areas to urban areas. It was an adjustment. They were also retired. And they had feelings of anxiety because they were no longer respected for their crafts or for their work. Mm -hmm. And so this was one of the ways to show they're productive and creative. So Lynn Gamwell knew that book. And she wrote me challenging me to say that she was working with a whirligig maker Mm -hmm. and wanted to know if my ideas applied to this whirligig maker that she had identified by the name of Peter Gelker. And can you describe what a whirligig is? Oh, sure. Uh, I'm sure you've seen them. And that is that they would be a figure who often would seem comical. That It might be somebody churning butter or a man with big giant arms mm-hmm. that is like a windmill and the wind blows on these giant arms and the figure moves. And they're often put in gardens. They're often homemade, not something that you would buy commercially, Mm -hmm. uh, but in a lot of yards, that's the kind of thing that people would put up. And, This uh, particular person seemed to follow the pattern of somebody who, in as an older adult, started making these whirligigs. Mm -hmm. And uh, then mysteriously stopped making them. And so I did a little more research on that. She was dealing with this from the point of view of an art curator. So she was asking me, again, from a cultural perspective viewpoint. What what is going on here? What is the significance of whirligigs? Again, something that we think is you know, as being fanciful, uh, but not something that's going to project our inner feelings. And I said, well, I don't know, but I'm, I'm willing to find out. Mm-hmm. And in talking to Peter Gelker, I discovered that he took this up in response to his father's death. And his father was a craftsman. And in fact, his father had given him tools as a birthday gift, 
maybe hoping that he would do that. Mm -hmm. He was a medical professional. So he felt in his eyes that he did not have the approval of his father. You would think, oh, he's mm -hmm. got to love his son who's got this uh, great lucrative job. But he felt that he was a disappointment to his father and his brother had continued to be a tradesperson. And so he, he mm -hmm. felt like the outlier in his family. And the story he told is then he went into his workshop. He saw these tools that his father had given him and he started making it almost like mm -hmm. a tribute or maybe I'm sorry saying, I'm sorry, I didn't do this, but I want to honor you. Mm -hmm. And he, at least he shared that it made him feel better. It was a, a form of therapy, but then he went further than his father did. And he had very creative kinds of work on Adam and Eve, religious themes, a lot about money, mm -hmm. which then I applied to his life that he had made a lot of money, but that didn't mean he was necessarily happy. Mm -hmm. So again, with these personal feelings that he was externalizing through mm -hmm. these kinds of whirly gigs. They were not something he sold. He just made them. And then at what point did he need them any longer since he wasn't doing it for an occupation? Interestingly, Gamwell encouraged him to put it in an exhibit. And the exhibit got critical acclaim, but the problem is that it depressed him because it made his feelings public. He didn't know that the public didn't catch on to that because the captions didn't say Peter Gelker made this because he was depressed. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But he felt vulnerable when it became public. So I'm sounding like I'm psychoanalyzing him. But the point was that when we look further, there are often motivations that are not going to be on the surface, but mm -hmm. that help us realize that there are different ways in which we cope with stress. And, and one of them is to rely on tradition and uh, particularly to use our hands to uh, produce these kinds uh, of works that are personally and socially meaningful. So the descriptions in the book were written what, by Gamwell or by Peter himself? They were written by Gamwell, the captions. Right, the yeah, captions. And then I yeah. provided the, the narrative and the background, and I've written more on him for a European book that is uh, coming out in addition. But then I also did something on canes, again, following this idea of why, why do people have canes if they don't need them to walk? There are people mm -hmm. who might have a, or had a walker or a walking stick. But there are a lot of people who have canes, especially men, as a kind of decoration. And then mm -hmm. they do all kinds of creative things with them. And again, I, I saw that as an expression of manliness, particularly at a time when they might be feeling frail in a youth-oriented society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, for me, I always think of a wizard with a cane. Or especially, I guess, more of a staff. Right. But so but I kind empowered. of associate. Yeah, I yeah. associate. An empowered with, person. Right, yeah. Or or wisdom for some reason. I'm not really sure why I would associate wisdom. Well, I, I would say because you're associating wisdom with old age. Probably. See the, the, yeah, the connection. symbolic progression then. You're thinking, oh, that person must be wise. They've got this cane or a specter, but yes. <laughs> then the further analysis, maybe the psychological analysis is the association of age. So it becomes compensatory that you're compensating for what might seem like a weakness with a strength. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, in the section that you wrote for the psychoanalysis section, you really go into the history of how the two yeah. fields of psychology and um, folklore started to communicate so that they could, you know, help one another. And you start off with a, 
a quote by Sigmund Freud. I'm just going to read it real quick. Um, Psychoanalysis and folklore have not allowed themselves to be deterred from transgressing these prohibitions and have been able, as a result, to teach us all kinds of things that are indispensable for understanding of human nature. So Freud is credited with being the father of psychology in a lot of yes. ways. But would you say that he was also in, in his own way a folklorist or what is his connection to folklore? In his study on jokes and their relations to the unconscious, he went beyond his clinical analysis of people with mental problems and he identified jokes that he heard which we would call folklore as expressions of the unconscious and of conflicts so you could say that he was folkloristically aware even though he was still a psychologist he wouldn't call mm -hmm. have called himself a folklorist mm -hmm. if you will but this was a great revelation at the time because collections of stories were done to show that a certain people had a, a narrative repertoire and we didn't think they did. A certain people would be creative. We didn't think they were, or it was to find the origin of Cinderella, let's say, by collecting all these stories uh, across the world. And he's doing it with individual people and then mm -hmm. asking the context and Particularly at that time, he was one of the first people to talk about gender relations and ethnic relations because he focused on Jewish jokes and anti-Semitic jokes to ask why we have anti-Semitic jokes mm -hmm. if we're supposedly getting enlightened. Of course, he, this uh, turned out not to be true with what happened in Central Europe and, and World War II, but this is what his his thinking was at the time and he was mm -hmm. also asking why there's there are so many indirect references to feces and, and sex uh, which was controversial at the time with victorian kinds of standards now he did end up writing a forward to a work by gregory bork uh, about scatological customs all around the world and this is remarkable because he clearly or it clearly was an ethnologist or or a folklorist he went out among native americans mm -hmm. and he wasn't using psychology he was thinking boy there are awful lot of these rituals are around feces <laughs> but then freud in his introduction is saying oh there's something here and that's because this is again something that's disturbing it's personal it's about the body and we sublimate it and it comes out in, in different ways oh, okay so uh, and then others including alan dundee's picked up on that with different kinds of genres songs and stories and even artwork that that followed uh, from that early experience there are some who criticize Freud then as being very male-centered. And I would just mention this. I don't know if we're getting short on time. But one of Dundee's contribution is to talk about womb envy because Freud talked about penis envy mm -hmm. and the idea that at the age of five, children become aware of their differences, of their physical mm -hmm. differences with the idea that the, the penis is superior. And he Dundee said, well, that doesn't quite sound right because what about these other instances in which uh, males are jealous of the power of women to procreate? Mm -hmm. They have babies, and now we see a lot of movies with that theme, don't we? Mm -hmm. Men having babies, and Dundee's would have loved those kinds of films that have come out. So he uh, looked, for example, at Santa Claus, and he said Santa Claus is an example of womb envy. This figure who's large, rotund, looks pregnant, 
comes in with a bag going down a chimney or kind of birth canal, if you will, spreading <laughs> presents. Oh, my God. Um, a lot of people did not buy that, I should say uh, to you all. But, I mean, it's an example of this uh, kind of idea. Or uh, mm -hmm. he also talked about wishing wells. How many times have you or your audience thrown a penny in a fountain? Why? What is that about? Just because mm -hmm. there are a lot of other pennies at the bottom? Mm -hmm. Well, Dundee's uh, claim that this is another example of uh, womb envy because of the, the coin and the water as a maternal kind of uh, symbol. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Um, so. That, yeah, and that's in the book, by the, in the meaning of folklore, the folklore of wishing wells, which I found interesting it had not been reprinted. Uh, before I uh, picked up on that, but I liked it because it's another example of an everyday practice yeah. that people may do what they think of as mindlessly, but actually involve a lot of mind. Yeah, that's that's very true. Um, and you in the um, so back to the other book, you talk a lot about the the history of um. So you start with the Jubilee Conference, I believe, and you yes. said it was a milestone event uh, because psycho psychoanalysts were the first time speaking directly to folklorists. Can you talk a little bit about that event and what it led to? Yeah, this was in London, and Europe was, after all, the hotbed of psychoanalysis, and there was also someone by the name of Ernest Jones, who was. Uh, one of the students of Freud, who was uh, very active there. And the two fields were of folklore and psychoanalysis were both rising fields at the time. Folklore mm -hmm. was a very popular topic in the Victorian era, which mm. will have to be another podcast to talk about why that is. But yeah. Uh, so the idea was, here are these two rising fields. They're getting a lot of press. There are not academic departments for them yet, but yet there are a oh. lot of books coming out. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, There are many learned societies devoted to these two. Why don't we bring them together for a dialogue? But it uh, was filled with tension. So the idea was great, and to have this dialogue. But again, the folk, the Victorians, particularly at that time, had a difficult time of thinking of I, meanings that were outside the awareness of the people that they had. And plus, they rubbed against their idea. The folklore consisted of survivals of the ancient, bizarre past because the psychoanalysts wanted to say, no, this is going on now. And you're as likely to have folklore as the people in the bush that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And the whole colonial view was challenged mm -hmm. by this idea. Uh, but yet coming out of that, the psychoanalysts realized what the potential was in this body of folklore that folklorists were studying, even if folklorists didn't analyze it. Uh, the way that they did, the folk of the Victorian folklorists then began to understand, I think, or the silver lining is that there are also emerging forms of folklore. It's not all in some savage past, which was mm -hmm. part of the terminology of the time. So how do they explain uh, new kinds of legends, such as the mm -hmm. vanishing hitchhiker, for example. I'm sure your listeners are familiar with that, this idea of a teen, and there are songs about this teenage girl leaves a party and the boyfriend won't uh, pick her up. Uh, and so she hitchhikes a ride with someone and then she disappears. Mm -hmm. And so the person who picked her up is all confused about it. And 
goes to the house anyway. And they say, oh, just a minute, please come inside. And then he looks on the mantle. He says, that's a picture of her. That's her right there. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, yes, on this date, this happens every year that that's our daughter who died on this date on the way from a party. (sighs) Sigh. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So... (laughs) And again, this has been interpreted uh, variously, but it seems to be a 20th century story with the advent of transportation. There are some who have said you can also hear this with carriages, but the idea of migration, there's a ghost part of it about the supernatural, although you notice there's no mention that that's our ghost. That's left for the commentary, for the discussion. This is why I say, to look at practices and how people use this and use it to broach some uh, difficult kinds of topics. The vulnerability of women Mm -hmm. comes out in in this, and there's a whole subgenre that's become very popular of the urban or contemporary legend. Of what their purpose is and why we, we enjoy talking about them so much? That and also that they are forms of folklore that are emergent, that they often speak to dangers that we perceive now. So you probably remember when there was a whole thing about the cat in the microwave oven, uh, for I don't, example. I don't know new, that one. Oh, <laughs> well, I see a nod from your engineer. It, yeah, uh, please tell us the story. The, the story <laughs> I need to about hear it now. Someone gets a new microwave and their cat is wet. So they have this great idea of putting it in the microwave oven. It zaps the cat. Sorry if that disturbs cat lovers out there. I'm just repeating the story. It was very popular. And again, it was this discomfort with a new technology, for example, or even the Kentucky Fried Rat, for example. If someone goes to a fast food chain and they get what seems like a, a rat in their box at the time when fast food places were emerging and there was a kind of mystery. How do they produce that food so quickly, right? Mass mm-hmm. produce it and give it to us. That could be and a whole was, podcast, I'm sure, but right. that's a, <laughs> some it, examples of the genre. And they rise and fall with often these kinds of technologies that that come out. And there certainly are a lot of stories and legends about computers and still today and cell oh, phones. Oh, okay. I need, well. I need to hear a legend about a computer now. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think we could just talk about the idea that I'm sure many of your listeners probably will come in with that there's a ghost in machine and that it has a mind of its own. So mm-hmm. how many times has someone at work come into work and, and say, my, my computer has a mind of its own or it's doing this to me. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe that's a belief rather than a specific story, but uh, this is, a, I think, a very common projection about concern that the machines are going to be controlling uh, the humans, if you mm. will, in, in the workplace. <laughs> yes, I, I definitely. <laughs> if you have, do you have an Alexa at home? If you ask Alexa, um, what was it? What is the machine in the, term- the Terminator? The one that takes over? Anyways, if if you ask Alexa if she is this machine, she ha- Skynet. Yes, exactly. If you ask right. Alexa if she's Skynet, she has a really um, hilarious retort, uh, which oh. says that she's not, and it's it's really funny. But it was it must have been mentioned enough for the programmers to have put that into her um, her response mechanisms. I uh, haven't which, done that, but I'll give it a shot. You I mean, should. Certainly, really- a lot of people. Well, a lot of people reacted to 2001 A Space Odyssey. Was it Harold? Was that the the computer's name and the whole Hal? Thank you. Uh, who, again, had a, a mind of its own, even though it's supposed to be 
controlled. And this is also an example that uh, folklore also applies to popular culture. We see this on an everyday basis that might even be structural. So it might not be the exact story. There have been a lot of folklorists who have looked at things like Star Wars and said, well, that's a fairy tale trope for example, mm-hmm. in a structure that, that people recognize. And that's one of the reasons for its appeal. Mm-hmm. Well, and you, you could say that, you know, we, we give personality to basically all machines. I mean, we, we name cars and boats yes. she, right? And so there, there must be, you know, meaning and folklore behind all of that as well. Absolutely. And if you go to Japan, they even have a wish that you can hang for because of their animistic uh, religion there that would ensure that the spirits are good to you in the car or St. Christopher medal, which is applied then to the car. Mm, Interesting. Um, Okay, so we're running we're running low on time. So let me see. What last questions I want to ask you? Um, what would you say is your biggest? <sighs> Not takeaway. Um, where do you see psychology and folklore going in the future? And what are you seeing it doing right now, I guess? Well, maybe a way to close this is then to talk about the application of research. Okay, yeah. Because all along, I'm basically an academic uh, researcher, and I do these kinds of studies using library work as well as tradition bearers to interview. But I'm also concerned uh, about what we do with this knowledge to benefit society, if you will. And there was a sense, as I said, with Dundee's where he wanted to expose ethnic and racist jokes to be able to have a conversation about dialogue. Because a lot of my work has been on aging and on human development in childhood and old age and adolescence, even adulthood as well, I, I'd like to see encouragement of cultural expression as therapy and ways in which people can express themselves through folk art and through traditions. Mm -hmm. And also, even now that I'm an academic dean, I think about trying to create a cultural environment, not just an academic environment here. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the ways, personally, I think I've applied some of my work, that people have a sense of belonging, a sense of comfort where they are because cultural reminders, and I probably have introduced my own rituals in my Mm -hmm. university or in the workplace as well because of my understanding of the need for mindfulness, the need for comfort often in a strange, unpredictable future, which seems to be the normal in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And there are examples of that already. There are people who do music therapy, art therapy, but I'm suggesting we can integrate folklore, storytelling, art making. We have in my college something we introduced called the makerspace in which We have Mm -hmm. 18-year-olds doing craft, and Mm -hmm. a lot of them folk craft, so they, and this is interesting, they will say, you do it and realize this is a folk craft, such as origami, it makes it more meaningful for them. It has a depth. They feel like they're part of some greater picture. So do you see this as a new new area of study, of a, a convergence of psychology and folklore combined, or where do you see this? going? I don't want to say it's new. There are works and bibliography that people can look at, but it's often been at the point of suggesting it. And I would say that uh, perhaps it's an emerging applied field Mm -hmm. that then raises its own kind of theoretical and ethical 
uh, kinds of questions. And so I, I see great potential mm -hmm. for it, especially as mental health issues have gotten on the front page of newspapers and our sense of love and hate for technology and progress, quite mm -hmm. honestly, with you that we love this idea of that we can have the world at our fingertips, but then there are times we say, I have to get off the grid. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's too, too much information, if you will. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that an understanding of the persistence of folklore, its functions for mm -hmm. us as a society and also as individuals, I, I think is a wide open area for exploration. And do you, do you see psychologists studying folklore as well i mean i i know that you as a folklorist is you are you know dabbling in some psychology are you seeing it vice versa as well i do and i've quoted those kinds of studies i'm very interested in that in fact a, a relatively new group in the american folklore society is one on folklore and science and we have a, a psychology working group that is small but i we're having great conversations and and great topics, and it includes psychologists who are doing more laboratory studies, for example, with children, and and for instance, they're using their use of wishes and belief. At mm. what time? At what point in our lives do we learn that there's no Santa Claus and the reality hits us of the mm -hmm. mundane and do we still do wishing? I have an essay on wishing, for example, as a, a very basic human response that is challenged by modernization and whether that's good or bad. Uh, even mm -hmm. looking at digital correspondence, I have another essay. I would, I'll just throw this out to your listeners. Why do we start so many emails with, I hope you're well, or I wish you well? Mm -hmm. It, that repetition, that variation suggests a, a whole cultural kind of connection uh, mm -hmm. between us and the use, even though this is a formal piece of technological writing, if you, if mm -hmm. you will. Yeah, it, it is something that I write in my emails, but I, you know, my personality is such that I have to get out the meat of what I'm writing first. And then I go back and I write the niceties, the cultural niceties that are expected in an email. And so if it was just me, I would just, you know, re send out the meat and <laughs> I'd be okay. But I know that there's, there's expectations and then there's um, consequences when you don't <laughs> meet those expectations. Well, you've entered into a cognitive process, if you will. And, and I bet you think about who am I sending this to? What mm -hmm. is appropriate? for me and my personality, as well as the receiver. Mm -hmm. And there's pressure on you because sometimes you have to figure out who you're writing. How will they take this the wrong way? And particularly because mm -hmm. they can't see your face. They can't see your gestures as I'm doing here right. Right now and so forth. Exactly. So that's a good well, example of emergent practices that then get perceived as culture and tradition. Right. Well, I want to give you a little bit of um, space to talk about your uh, new book that you have on the market. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, the practice of folklore incorporates a lot of these studies that I mentioned under the idea that everyday practices that we engage in truly have meaning, many of them outside of our awareness. So they include everything such as belief in the boogeyman or how parents use the boogeyman as social control mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. their children mm -hmm. to the singing of a song such as Barnacle Bill that many uh, men know and women not so much. Mm -hmm. and why uh, those kinds of practices persist, why they occur and what they mean. Interesting. Well, that might just have to be another podcast. I, I always do find it so interesting, you know, I, I'm married and when I speak with my husband, we speak in one way, but then when he gets on the phone with another male, it's an entirely 
different conver- conversation. They 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 just have a completely different way of speaking to one another than he has with speaking with me. And so I definitely find that practice of folklore very fascinating. Well, as a folklorist, I bet if you pointed that out to him, he'd say, I don't do that. What do you mean? Oh, no. He's very well aware of it. He oh, said, okay. That's just how, he's always talking about, this is what guys do. This is how guys communicate. This You have to, you have to be in the, the guy world to understand this. Well, maybe that'll be your next book. Uh, there is a yeah. movie, A Grand Torino, if you're familiar with that, that has a hilarious scene with Clint Eastwood explaining to this immigrant of uh-huh. how you talk like a guy in a barber shop. <laughs> and he, the immigrant teen is confused because he's saying, if you want to show you like someone, you insult them. He's looking, what? What do you mean? <laughs> that yeah, you don't want to get intimate and be nice to another guy. Mm-hmm. You might yeah. do that to a woman, but not to a guy. But you have to keep your distance, and so then he insulting the is a sort of intimacy. He, yes, and he has a string of insults, and then the person <laughs> takes it the wrong way and picks up his bat. <laughs> it's oh, hilarious, but very telling. I think people laugh because they said, "Oh." I resonate with that. Yeah. Well, and why do we do that? That is very fascinating. Okay. And well, that's thank you so much. Those insults. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, and thank you, folky folks, for joining us on the podcast. As usual, all links uh, that we've mentioned today and maybe some pictures of the whirly gigs and some of the artwork that you talked about, we can add on there as well. Um, so that you can see some examples on our website, www.fabricoffolklore.com. And you also will also have links for how to, uh, you know, find Dr. Bronner as well. And his books, his many, many books on folklore. Um, Also, if you enjoyed the episode, we'd love to hear from you. Um, So we have a Facebook group page. And uh, we would love it if you commented and let us know what you think and what who you want to hear from next or what topic you would like to hear about. Um, please subscribe so you don't, never miss an episode. Um, and if you are watching on YouTube, make sure and like. And if you are listening on iTunes, give us all the stars, all of the stars. Um, but the most important thing that you can do is tell someone about the show. So even if it's just the cashier at your local grocery store, you can tell them about how the, this Fabric of Folklore podcast is not actually about uh, fabric. It's all about uh, folklore, and it's the bee's knees. So uh, thank you again, listeners, and I can't wait to join you again to unravel the mysteries of folklore. Folklore.